first year of medical school, all medical students take one month of genetics. And the person that ran that course was um, the chairman of the pediatric department at Northwestern, Henry Nadler, who's a geneticist. And the amazing thing that Henry did was when he made rounds with the students and the, and the residents, and this is back in the 70s and the early 80s, um, he brought up genetic principles with every patient that we rounded on. It, it made me want to do what he did. I thought that it was the best way I could take care of children, um, understanding um, what their diseases were due to. Um, and also, you know, in pediatrics, there's a whole group of con a whole group of children who have undiagnosed conditions. You know, this is back in the in the mid '70s. You know, there were a lot of children with intellectual disability, with birth defects, with metabolic diseases, and we didn't know what they had. And genetics was going to be the key to figuring out what their problems were and how to treat them. If a child is born with an, a chromosome abnormality, we can't ever change that. Um, what we can do is optimize their care and help them navigate both the medical system and, and the educational system. Being a, ge a medical geneticist, you can do a bunch of things at the same time. So you can be a clinician and take care of patients. Um, you can teach your own residents in genetics and other residents and other fields, other trainees, you know, neurologists, pediatricians, internists, surgeons, about genetics. Um, it allows me to do clinical research. Um, and it actually allows me to get involved in the national level on policy with regards to children's health care and, and genetic issues. Um, so so it's, a, it's, a, it's a great specialty for um, multitasking in many ways um, and doing a lot of things at the same time that keep you interested. They actually um, run the gamut from fetuses with abnormalities noted on ultrasound prenatally to, to parents and grandparents of, of patients that I see in the genetics clinic. Um, and, and that's what makes it interesting. There's a, a wide variety of kids. So in one day, I may see a couple whose child has been diagnosed with having some congenital abnormality on ultrasound, and they need to understand that. And then my next patient might be um, a young child with intellectual disability that we're trying to figure out the reason for it. And then, you know, I may go into my neurofibromatosis clinic where I take care of kids with, with neurofibromatosis. It's a nice mix of patients. Patients' needs don't happen between nine and five during the day. And so I think most of us have figured out a way to, to do what we need to do for our, the patients we care for um, and also have a very wonderful, rich family life on the outside. Genetics is great for people who actually want a work-life balance because you can structure your, your job into so many different ways. I know that other specialties have actually, they all advance. You know, cardiology is in practice now the way it was practiced 25 years ago. But the, the pace of discovery in genetics and, and the advancement of knowledge has been so much on a completely different trajectory than other specialties, and it's continuing. We actually have clinical trials and molecularly based therapies for conditions that 25 years ago I never thought would be treatable. And so now it's, it's a little bit of a different conversation that I have with parents. You know, I may say that this isn't treatable now in a sense that we can't try to make it better, but it may be in five years or it may be in 10 years. Um, so even that difficult conversation is, is, is shifting a little. The other exciting thing is I think we may be able to, within my lifetime, tell people pre-symptomatically what they may be um, at risk for. And as a pediatrician, wouldn't it be great if you can actually tell a child that they may be at risk to develop diabetes, or they may be at risk to develop asthma, or they may be at risk to develop obesity, because you can actually make lifetime lifestyle changes in a child much more easily than you can in an adult. Um, so as a pediatrician, I'm actually excited about what genetics could do for common diseases. You know, we, we've kind of been stuck into this rare disease corner. 
People always think of medical geneticists as, as taking care of puzzles. We're the, we're the puzzle solvers. You, you send people to genetics and maybe they can kind of figure out what your problem is. Um, but we really have to start thinking about how medical geneticists are, are going to actually revolutionize the care of people with common diseases. And I think we're there now. And that's going to be the most exciting part of genetics moving forward. There's a two-year training program, a residency in genetics, but you have to do something else first. So most people train in either pediatrics or internal medicine or obstetrics um, on maternal fetal medicine. We've had neurologists that we've trained in genetics. Um, we've had psychiatrists that we've trained in genetics. There are other paths also. There are combined programs now right out of medical school that combine genetics with pediatrics, internal medicine, um, obstetrics and gynecology and then also genetics and maternal fetal medicine. As a geneticist, you can probably, do, you can do whatever you want. If you're a clinician that just wants to do clinical medicine, you can spend your entire week taking care of patients. Um, if you want to be a researcher, you can either do clinical research or basic research 80% of the time and see clinical patients 20% of the time. You can teach in both those settings. Um, the public policy um, opportunities are, are vast for genetics. Um, we need an, a, a national policy in terms of how to educate the public and other providers about how genetics can help um, improve health care. One of the most gratifying things is being able to tell people um, what's going on with their children. You know, anytime you're a parent of a child and you can't, and, and, and either the child has a birth defect or has intellectual disability, um, and if you don't know what caused that, there's just, the search can go on forever. And the first thing I tell a lot of mothers is, nothing you did caused this. This was completely outside of your control. And everybody shakes their head and says, yeah, 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 I understand that. But you know, two years later, or six months later, or three years later, when all of a sudden we have a new diagnostic technique, um, and I can actually say, you know, we know what, why your child has the problem that they had. You know, either there was a chromosome abnormality that we just couldn't detect before. You know, all of a sudden this look comes across the mother. Um, because it, all of a sudden, it's true what I said. Nothing she did cause this, but nobody ever believes that until you give someone a diagnosis. Um, and, and taking that sort of guilt and worry away from people is probably the, the most gratifying thing.